I'm going to deal today with uh, some further applications of uh, stereographic projections and also some detail associated with low symmetry systems such as the hexagonal or orthorhombic, etc. These are the seven crystal classes and the 32 point groups associated with those crystal classes, um, divided into non centrosymmetric and centrosymmetric point groups. I'm going to talk a little bit about the point group 3M in the trigonal crystal class. Now in, in black, we have a cubic F lattice, face-centered cubic lattice, and it's possible to draw a primitive lattice within that, which is trigonal. Now, of course, it's the same arrangement of lattice points, but if I want to get a phase transformation from the cubic F to trigonal, then I can apply a distortion along the 111 direction, and that would change the arrangement of lattice points so that you lose certain symmetries. And gallium indium phosphide, when it is epitaxially deposited from the vapor phase, undergoes a particular ordering of atoms that leads to a change from a cubic F symmetry with point group uh, bar 4 3M to a trigonal structure with a point group 3M. So a trigonal uh, structure has only one triad, whereas a cubic structure has four triads. So gallium indium phosphide has the point group 3M. So uh, I can represent the point group 3M on a stereographic projection where I place my threefold axis in the middle and this is the mirror plane that's parallel to the triad and because it's a triad we generate these further mirror planes. So if I place a point on this stereographic projection which is not located on any particular symmetry element other than a monad, a one-fold axis. Okay, so we call this a general position. Uh, if the point was located here, it would not be a general position, nor would it be if it was located on a mirror plane. So when I place a point at uh, uh, an object at that symmetry, which is just a one-fold rotation axis, the operation of the triad and the mirror planes uh, give us further locations which have exactly equivalent crystallography. So the triad has generated three such locations and if you now include the mirror planes then there are six crystallographically equivalent objects placed at that point symmetry. So the point symmetry here is a monad. If I put an atom anywhere where there isn't a, a higher order symmetry element I should get six atoms in the unit cell. Okay. So this is very useful because the point group is telling us how many atoms to expect in the unit cell as a function of the point symmetry at which you place an atom. If you place an atom at a general location, then with the point group 3M, uh, we will necessarily have a total of six atoms of that kind in the unit cell. Now, a further thing to notice about the point group 3M is that there is no center of symmetry. So for example, if I take this atom here and invert it through the center, I get nothing here, okay? So um, the structure is what we call a polar group because, you know, in the positive direction outside of the plane of the board, uh, there is a difference between going into the plane of the board because there are no atoms underneath uh, in the southern hemisphere here. So there's no center of symmetry and this is called a polar group. Uh, there's another structure uh, which is 6mm uh, which also does not have a center of symmetry. It uh, belongs to the hexagonal system and is a polar group and here is my hexad, 
and these are mirror planes and there's an independent set of mirror planes parallel to the hex set. Um, so we have the point group 6MM represented on this projection. If I now place an atom at a general location, for example here, then the operation of the hex set and the mirror planes will lead to a total of 12 atoms at crystallographically equivalent positions in the unit cell. So the point I'm trying to emphasize is that given this notation here, the place where we put an atom, the symmetry of that point determines how many other equivalent positions in the unit cell you will find such atoms. In this case, 12 atoms. Now, the point group 6mm also describes the structure of the hexagonal variety of gallium nitride. In a previous lecture, I talked about the cubic variety, but the hexagonal variety is the one that features in most common light emitting diodes. The cubic variety is being researched on to produce more efficient green light emitting diodes. So the hexagonal gallium nitride as the point group symmetry 6mm. <coughs> and here is the structure with the z axis, the hex head pointing upwards. Now, notice uh, that when you deposit this epitaxially, uh, this surface in the minus z direction is different from this surface in the plus z direction. Uh, and that's because, uh, once again, there is no center of symmetry. Uh, so when depositing gallium nitride in the hexagonal form, it's important to get just one of these surfaces across your substrate. Otherwise, if you get both kinds of surfaces, then that's regarded as a defect, which influences the um, properties, the light emitting properties of the material. So in this structure, you know, going along positive Z is not the same as going along negative Z. And you can see that also from this stereographic projection that there is no center of symmetry because if I take this atom here, invert it through the center, I don't get one in the Southern hemisphere. Okay? All of these are located in the Northern hemisphere of the stereographic projection. Okay, so these are polar groups and uh, they have consequences on gallium nitride deposition and also on the um, gallium indium phosphide that I discussed earlier. Now, we are going to use this knowledge, uh, the knowledge that placing an atom at a certain point symmetry, that means a symmetry at that point within a point group determines the number of atoms in the unit cell, and therefore you can use this information to solve the structure, in other words, the location of the atoms inside the cell. So uh, here is a particular compound, which is lead titanate, and you've done some experiments. So you know that the chemical formula is titanium, one titanium atom, one lead atom, and three oxygen atoms. Uh, using elementary X-ray diffraction, you know that this is a tetragonal lattice, okay? Very easy to determine just by looking at uh, a Levi Scherer pattern. And by measuring the lattice parameters, you know the cell volume, okay? Now, by measuring the density, uh, knowing the cell volume and the mass of your sample, uh, you determine that within the unit cell, there is one lead atom, one titanium atom, and three oxygen atoms. So this necessarily means that this is a primitive tetragonal lattice because these are all different. So there's a motif of this formula unit per lattice point, and it's a primitive tetragonal lattice. Uh, you know from other work that the valency of titanium is four plus, 
that of lead is two plus and of oxygen two minus. And you know that this is a piezoelectric material because somebody has done a test where they stressed it and found an electrical potential developing. If it's piezoelectric, then clearly it cannot have a center of symmetry. So by looking at these experimental data, you have determined its chemical composition, its density, the number of atoms in the unit cell, and the fact that it's primitive and there is no center of symmetry. But we haven't determined where the atoms are actually located. So that's our, our next task. So we know that it's tetragonal. So we go back to our table of crystal classes. And if it's tetragonal, then the, these are and non centrosymmetric because it's piezoelectric. Then these are the only possible point groups that we can access. Okay. Uh, and you can, you can imagine that if we have three atoms in the unit cell, then they would have to be at the face centers because there are six faces to the tetragonal cell and each face is shared between two unit cells. Therefore, there can only be three oxygen atoms per, per uh, unit cell. Uh, the titanium and the lead would be at equivalent point symmetries because they both have individual titanium and uh, or just one titanium and just one lead atom in the cell. So they've got to be at the same sort of point symmetry. And we know that titanium has a greater valency and therefore it should be next to a larger number of oxygen ions than the lead is. The coordination of oxygen ions around the titanium should be greater than that around lead. So there's quite a lot of information we are gathering apart from the symmetry of the structure to determine what uh, the locations of the atoms are. Now, you, you can take a guess, all right? Take a guess of what point group actually represents uh, lead titanate. And I'm going to choose 4mm. So 4mm means that we have a tetrad pointing along the vertical axis and there are two mirror planes which are parallel to the tetrad, which is the mirror plane here, 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 and one going this way. Now I've already drawn in the atomic positions, but ignore that for the moment. Uh, we've decided already that the oxygen atoms, because there's only three of them, are located at the phase centers here and here. And we'll show you uh, later, sorry, we'll show later that that is consistent with the point group symmetry. And we will discover that the titanium atoms are located here, but not at the center. And the lead atoms are located not at the corners, but slightly above the corners. But this information you don't have at the moment. All you know is that the oxygen atoms are located at the phase centers. So the point group is 4mm. Uh, so that means that we have a tetrad at the center of this diagram. We have a set of mirror planes here and an independent set of mirror planes parallel to the fourfold axis. Now, if I place uh, an atom at a general location such as this, then the operation of the fourfold axis will create four atoms in the cell. And when the mirrors do their bit, you will find eight atoms inside the unit cell, okay? So if you place an atom at a general position when the point group symmetry is four mm, then you'll end up with eight atoms in the unit cell. And that obviously is not the correct location of any of the atoms, uh, titanium, lead, and oxygen, because we do not have eight of any species within the unit cell. So a general location, XYZ with a site symmetry monad, 
would require eight search items in the unit cell. Now, supposing that you place the atoms at, at a location on the mirror planes, then you would generate four atoms in the unit cell, and we don't have four atoms of any species within the unit cell. If you place an atom on the tetrad, there will be just one of those atoms. So this gives you a clue that the titanium and the lead will be located on fourfold axes. Now, calculations like these have been done for all crystal systems and are available in the crystallographic tables. And uh, this is a, an abbreviated form of such a crystallographic table, in this case for the point group 4mm. And you can see that if you place an atom at a general location, then you will end up with eight such atoms. If you place an atom at a fourfold axis, then you will have just one of those atoms. And according to this table, there are two such locations with point group symmetries 4mm. So one of those locations obviously is the tetrad passing through the center of the cell and the two mirror planes are there and there. Okay, so 4mm is the point group symmetry along this axis. And similarly, there's a fourfold axis here and the, the same two mirror planes. So these two locations have point group symmetries 4mm and we expect just one per one atom per cell. So we decided earlier on that titanium needs to be well coordinated by oxygen because it has a valency of four whereas oxygen has a valency of two minus. So we place the titanium atom here. Uh, whereas the lead has a lower coordination of the oxygen atoms and it's appropriate to put it near the corner. We cannot uh, put these atoms exactly at the body center or the corner because that would introduce a center of symmetry. Okay, So we know that the lead atom and the titanium atoms are not located exactly at half, half, half or zero, zero, zero. So you can see that the notation here is half, half Z and zero, zero, Z, because uh, this is slightly above the corner and this is slightly above the body center. And that's why when we deform the material, uh, the charges are not displaced uh, uh, equally and therefore we end up with a dipole. So that is the correct solution of the crystal structure of lead titanate. And the titanium atoms are located a little bit above the body center and the lead atoms are located a little bit above the corner. So these four atoms are not actually in the unit cell and these atoms at the corners uh, are actually on the edge of the unit cell and therefore uh, they are shared between four cells. So you have one, two, three, four times a quarter gives you just one atom. So the complete description of the symmetry here is P4MM primitive, and then we have the point group symmetry. Now, I will teach you later about space groups, and this is the space group of lead titanate, and there are no translational elements of symmetry in this, okay? Uh, and that's why I'm able to call this a space group, even though we haven't as yet covered the consequences of translational elements of symmetry. So you see how to solve for crystal structure when you don't know the positions of the atoms, you have to use quite a lot of uh, information together with things like the um, um, crystallographic tables to get to the right answer. You can of course uh, do a more complex x-ray analysis which deals with intensities to prove that this structure is the correct structure. Now, uh, this is just a, a summary once again of everything we've done. So the atoms here, uh, uh, oxygen atoms here 
have a point symmetry, which is 2 mm. So there's only two of those. They are at the face centers, the vertical face centers. So they are shared between two cells. Uh, the oxygen atom here has a point group symmetry 4 mm, and therefore uh, it is different. Uh, it has a different point symmetry to these oxygen atoms. These are also at 4 mm, and so is the titanium atom. It's really quite interesting how the complete structure can be solved rather than just the lattice type and the lattice parameters and so forth. So going back to this table, I've obviously cheated a little bit by picking the correct answer. So let's, uh, let's look at what would happen if I picked this particular point group as a trial structure. So here is our um, crystallographic table. All these, as I said to you, have been worked out and you can find them on the web or in standard tables. Uh, so this is now for the tetragonal primitive structure with a point group 422. Well, I can actually place a lead atom exactly at the corner. Uh, so there's just one lead atom. Uh, I can place an oxygen atom at a face center and another two oxygen atoms at other face centers. So that's fine. Uh, but there's no nowhere I can put a single titanium atom because, for example, if I place it uh, at this location where the fourfold axis is passing and it's not exactly at half, half, half because we would not get piezo electricity, then I would generate two such positions, two such atoms in the cell. That clearly is wrong. And similarly, this is zero, zero, zero. Uh, if I had used zero, zero, Z because we have piezo electric properties, then we would end up with two lead atoms in the cell. So if you had selected the wrong point group out of the ones available for non centrosymmetric tetragonal cells, then you would not be able to fit the structure to all the other information that you have. Okay? So I think this is a very nice example to show how you can solve for structure using uh, many, much of the information that you already know combined with symmetry elements. Now, in the case of titan, the titanate, we discussed there is no center of symmetry and it's piezoelectric. But you know, the presence or absence of a center of symmetry actually permeates through a great deal of science, not simply crystal structures. So um, we generally take a free energy of a solution for granted, uh, but many solutions are not chemically homogeneous. They may have composition variations for example, in spinodal composition, etc., uh, spinodal decomposition, etc. Uh, so, this is what we normally take for granted. That means we assume that the solution is homogeneous uh, with a mean composition C bar, and that's the free energy that you use in calculations, for example, in phase diagram calculations. You assume that the system is, homo uh, the phase is homogeneous. But I can write the free energy of a chemically heterogeneous system as the free energy of the homogeneous system plus a dependence on the gradient of composition, on the second derivative of the gradient of composition and the square of the gradient of composition. So this is a, a generic uh, expansion. But if you have a center of symmetry in the crystal, then the free energy should not depend on the direction of the gradient. Okay, so, uh, so this term has to be zero when we have a centrosymmetric crystal with a heterogeneous distribution of solute. So you end up with just these three terms. Okay, so the consequences of crystal symmetry uh, stretch beyond just working out the crystal structure. It has implications in many other phenomena, for example, thermodynamics in various kinds of um, effects such as magnetostriction and so on. Okay, uh, we've dealt with the solution of structures to some extent because I've chose a system where there are no 
translational elements of symmetry. For example, the screw axes that I talked about in the first lecture and the glide planes where you reflect and you translate by uh, a rational fraction of the repeat distance. Now, this is a crystal called pyrite and it genuinely grows in these beautiful shapes, okay? Uh, and, you know, the defining symmetry of the cubic system is that you have four triads and you can obviously see that this is cubic and therefore it has four triads going along the body diagonals. Therefore, you can immediately say that pyrite, which is a sulfide of iron, has a cubic lattice, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you the, a movie of the structure. It's not terribly useful because there are too many atoms there. Um, so I'm going to now show you our usual way of simplifying the observation of uh, atoms in complex um, unit cells by drawing a projection onto the basal plane, okay? So this is now a projection of the cell onto the basal plane. Uh, where the small atoms are sulfur and the large atoms are iron. And of course, uh, this is a cubic unit cell. Now, unlike any other structure that we've observed, there are elements, which elements of symmetry that involve glide. So if you focus on this atom and this atom here, and this is a screw diode poking out of the plane of the board. So if I operate the screw diode, this atom here would end up at the wrong height here, but then I include a translation of half along the screw axis, and that recovers this position. And of course, the screw axis applies to all other atoms. So for example, this uh, iron atom located at a half, if I rotate and then translate half normal to the plane of the diagram, I recover the position. So these are screw diodes. The dashed lines here are glide planes. That means uh, you have a mirror plane and then um, uh, you reflect about that mirror plane and then you translate parallel to the mirror plane by a fraction of the repeat distance. So in this case, uh, if I take this atom at 0 0.39, I reflect it to this position here and then translate by a distance which is half the unit cell then I recover the position here. So because there is just one translation involved and it's a, it's a glide by half the unit cell, we call this an A-glide uh, plane, but we'll come to that later. So if I don't include these translation elements, then I won't be able to correctly predict the structure. Now, the problem is as follows, that when we look at the macroscopic shape of crystals like this. Translationals by a fraction of the lattice spacing make no difference, okay? So we don't actually have mirror planes in pyrite, we have glide planes. But when we are looking at the macroscopic shape, the translations involved are so small that they may as well be regarded as mirror planes, okay? So by looking at the shape of the crystal, you can work out the point group. So a glide plane changes into a mirror plane uh, or is perceived as a mirror plane. But you need to do a lot more work in solving the structure as we did for um, lead titanate to find uh, whether they are true mirror planes or glide planes, okay? So more of this in a, in a later lecture. Now, um, I'll skip this slide. I want to change the subject a little bit because I want to deal with structures in which have lower symmetries than cubic and so forth uh, in the same way as we deal with the cubic system. Now, you need to be careful because when the unit cell is not orthogonal, that means um, uh, autonormal, that means that all the axes are of equal length and the angles are all 90 degrees. When that is not the case, a plane with indices HKL will not be parallel to a direction with the same indices. 
So on this two-dimensional diagram, uh, this is the one-one plane, and this is the normal to the one-one one, the one, one plane. This is the direction one one, and clearly they are not parallel. So you need to be very careful when doing. Uh, you cannot actually use the method that we use for dot products in one of the lectures where we were finding angles. Uh, you, there are other techniques to do that. But you need to be careful that directions and in, uh, plane normals with the same indices are not necessarily parallel. Obviously, you know, if you're looking at this uh, 100 direction and this is the 100 plane, then the 100 direction happens to be parallel to the normal to the plane with the same indices but that's a special case all other planes that will not planes and direction they will be oriented differently in space even if they have the same indices now in the case of the cubic stereogram which i've, I've illustrated here um, and uh, the number at the top indicates uh, a lattice parameter of five arbitrary units okay um, so, a cubic stereogram doesn't change if I change the lattice parameters to eight, because we are simply plotting angles between vectors, and a cube is a cube no matter how big it is. So the angular relationships between the vectors are preserved. Now, if I change to an orthorhombic crystal with two, three different lattice parameters, the stereogram changes completely. So here we are plotting plane normals, okay? Uh, so these are all plane normals and because we have such an exaggerated difference between the lattice parameters this stereographic projection looks nothing like this okay now in the cubic system a direction with indices one on one would be parallel to a plane normal with indices one on one that is not the case for the orthorhombic system so we need to have two different stereographic projections, one for directions and one for plane normals to deal with the orthorhombic system. And furthermore, if the lattice parameter changes, then we need a different stereographic projection. So you can see uh, uh, the particular poles that are plotted here. This is the 001 uh, and this uh, is the 010 and this is the 011 and the relationships are different in the case of the orthorhombic cell. Uh, so this is just to illustrate that if I change the lattice parameters of the orthorhombic uh, unit cell, then clearly the stereographic projection also changes because the angular relationships are not preserved when I change the lattice parameters in a disproportionate manner. Okay, now this is uh, to show you that we need two stereographic projections, one for directions and one for plane normals. So this is, these are the plane normals, and you can see that the one-on-one -on -one direction is not parallel to the one-on-one -on -one plane normal. So with anything other than cubic, you need to worry about these things. Now the hexagonal system is a little bit peculiar. So this, uh, this is our hexagonal unit cell. This is the 100 direction. This is the 010 direction. And this space here is the 100 plane. And this is the 010 plane. And this is one bar one zero. Now on a stereographic projection, you're normally plotting plane normals. So, the temptation is that when we plot the stereogram, we take these as our axes with 120 degree angle. But in fact, we are plotting plane normals and the normal to the 100 plane is at 60 degrees to the normal to the 010 plane. So our projection looks like this. This is the normal to 100 and 010 and this is 60 degrees, not uh, not 120 degrees. So this is a common mistake when plotting stereographic projections for the hexagonal system. And you can also see the four volts, uh, six fold symmetry here. 
Okay, so this is our hexagonal unicell, and let me identify one of the curiosities of the hexagonal system. So these three planes, which are labeled as uh, one bar one zero, uh, sorry, this is uh, the first one is uh, one zero zero, this one is zero one zero, and that is one bar one zero, have different indices. You know, one bar one zero is not the same as this or this, and yet they are crystallographically equivalent. Okay. And that is a little bit strange because when we write the form 100, we mean this, this, and something with different indices, different um, integers inside our set of indices. Now to cope with this, uh, we have the Miller-Brave indices, where an additional axis is plotted. Uh, so t points in that direction there, and this is minus t. And we do the same thing as we do for the three index system, that we look at the intercepts of planes and so forth, but this time on all four indices, uh, axes, uh, x, y, t, and z. So we end up with um, plane indices which are four digits rather than three. And this index i is minus h plus k. So 100, zero, zero, uh, that's this plane here, it intersects the x axis at one. It does not intersect the y axis at all. So we have the index zero. It intersects the t axis at minus one. And it does not intersect the z axis. So we have one zero bar one zero. Similarly, this plane becomes zero, one bar one zero, and this one becomes one bar one zero zero. So now we have uh, permutations of the same set of indices for crystallographically equivalent planes. And the third index, as far as planes are concerned, is simply minus the sum of the first two. Okay, so on our stereographic plot, this is what happens with the four index notation. Um, so you'll see huge numbers of publications, books, etc., using the four index notation for the hexagonal system. And for planes, it's, uh, it's almost trivial because to convert to the th uh, three index notation, you just delete, delete this uh, third index. Now for directions, it's, uh, we also use four index notation, but it's a little bit more complicated because we want the vice zone rule to work even for the four index notation. So the vice zone rule is as follows, that in the three index notation, if I have a plane with indices H, K, L, and a direction with indices U, V, W, and the sum of these products is zero, that means that the direction UVW lies in the plane HKL. And I want to obtain the same sort of thing for the four index notation, where this is the four index notation for planes, and the capital letters here are the four index notation for directions. Notice that I haven't used small u or small v or small w anywhere because you will see that these are not equivalent to, uh, capital U is not equivalent to small u and so on. But we retain uh, the fact that the third index is simply the sum of uh, negative of the sum of the first two, just as we did for i. So if we take this equation now and we substitute for i, substitute for this i, then we obtain this minus h minus k j, and if I take all the terms in H and all the terms in K together, then this equation simplifies to H into U minus J plus K into V minus J plus LW is zero. And therefore, I can directly compare this equation with the three index equation and write that U is equal to U minus J, okay? And similarly, uh, V is equal to capital V minus K 
capital J, and so on. So the rules for changing between directions, uh, a four index and three index notation for direction, uh, derived as I explained in the previous slide, are uh, simply simply as follows. So let me show you an example. So this is the one zero zero direction. Uh, this is the x-axis here. Uh, so one zero zero simply goes from this point here to this point. Yeah. This is one third two bar one bar one zero. So if I go two along here, the red line, and then I go minus one along y, okay, this is the minus one, and minus t along this direction. Then this is two bar one bar one, and we're not going uh, parallel to z, so it's two bar one bar one zero. And it's one third because the magnitude of this vector is three times that of one zero zero, and similarly. And this is the generic method of transforming between the three index and four index notation. So small. Okay, that's the end of uh, today's lecture.